evening. Our first speaker is Jos van Anderberg from uh, is that Chena, Sina? Or Chena Erev? Chena Erev. You want to say the original language or experiences from tuning uh, high resolution climate modeling with this year. This? Okay. So, um, yes, so what I want to show you is uh, some of the things we have done in the past years uh, regarding, regarding mainly tuning a climate model, namely ECOT. Uh, ECOT is based on IFS, so I think it's, it will be of interest for, for this community. And, um, and well, I, I will come to the main points. But, uh, of course, the point is that ECOT, of course, is a climate model. So we are interested in longer timescales than what we would be interested in for weather forecasting. So first, a few words on ECOT. Um, which has already been shown and mentioned by, by many speakers in these days. Um, ECOT is actually is mainly uh, a global mo climate model. It's quite a recent one in the sense that development has uh, started in the, in the, well, basically 10 years ago, in 2006 or 7, or so, the, the first idea came out. It was the first version, version uh, ECOT 2. But already then, the current version we are working on, which is version 3, has started development, and actually I just checked this morning and asked Uwe, who actually did that. Uh, the first commits were from 2009. Uh, to give a reference, uh, ECR 3.0, which is basically what we're working on now, is basically a continuation of, the, of that version, was released in 2012. Mm. ECR is based on IFS. It's based on IFS cycle 36. Um, our idea is actually to move on to open IFS in the next future. So um, ECOT will, will prepare this year a new science and, impl uh, uh, new science and implementation plan, which, which uh, will also state clearly this, this plan. The idea is actually that ECOT version 4 would be based on open IFS. And this will have many advantages, among others, to have a closer interaction uh, with open IFS community, to, to have uh, development cycles which are closer. Uh, faster updates, uh, etc. And I think also there is a lot to be gained from uh, parallel development and basically the same issues not having to be solved uh, over and over again. Um, of course, as a GCM, uh, ECOT need, uh, needs uh, uh, um, an ocean. It uses NEMO. It uses, has, makes a particular choice for the IC model, in, in which is LIM3. And well, for land, of course, coming from IFS, it's, use, it's using HTSL, and this is the GCM. But ECOT is also, or has a mission, and it is also being developed as an Earth system model. So other components <coughs> at the same time are ready and have been coupled to the model. And so we have a dynamic vegetation model, and uh, there's an a, uh, there's a interactive uh, atmospheric aerosol and chemistry module, TT, which is based on TM5. The <coughs> dynamic vegetation instead is LPJ gas. And um, there's a biochemistry model for, uh, from, for the ocean, fishes. So basically, all these components are, have been uh, under heavy development uh, and, and been coupled to ECOT um, in the past years. Uh, the goal is actually to develop an overall a system model which is ready to do CMIP6 integrations. And I think, uh, well, time schedule is always a bit too optimistic, but I think uh, things are well underway for, for this goal. Um, finally, ECOT is also a consortium because ECOT is uh, based, uh, is, uh, it sees the contribution of a large community uh, of uh, European institutions which are contributing. Uh, this slide may not be completely updated, so if you're involved in ECOT and you don't find yourself here, don't be offended, this is an older one. But uh, <coughs> so basically, we talk about something like 22 European institutions contributing to, actively contributing to the development of ECOT. Um, the original plan of ECOT, well, the, one of the motivations also this uh, idea of uh, seamless prediction that you have a model which you start from a weather model. You can apply it also longer time scales, and then you end up with climate. And the idea is that, of course, if you make a good model for one, by the physics being the same, why shouldn't you be able to, to have a good model also at longer time scales? Um, so the tuning of the model, well, by, I will go more in detail what I mean by tuning, of course. But um, <coughs> uh, 
uh, the goals of, of the tuning of the model are mainly to improve some certain things in the model and to make it ready to be competitive with other models in CMIP6. Uh, obviously, it's all uh, aimed at having a more realistic model. And the first thing we looked at, and actually we worked a lot, and actually a, lot of, a great part of my presentation will be on this, was actually on looking at energy fluxes, energy balances, mass fluxes, and mass balances. Um, and the reason for that is actually that it's quite different to tune a weather model from a, a climate model in the sense that certainly you need to take everything what, what the, the, um, the you had. You certainly need to have all the parts which, which you would look at in a weather model. And actually, being based on IFS, you would say that part is already well tuned. I mean, ECM WF does a, did a, spends a lot of effort in doing this to the best, to, to state of art. So actually, why would we need tuning? Well, the problem is that if we look at longer time scales, <coughs> tuning a climate model <coughs> poses new problems and new issues. There are some things like mass conservation and energy conservation, which may, may be negligible over shorter time scales and may become very, very important over long time scales. Say, a small uh, uh, imbalance in P minus E, precipitation minus evaporation, may be completely irrelevant at short time scales or even at seasonal time scales. But over 100 years, it may change your sea level heights by meters and meters. And so obviously, it, it, it will be very relevant. And so you don't uh, want that in your model. And the other thing, as we will soon see also, is that actually energy and mass conservation are sort of related because obviously mass conservation also implies, or missing mass conservation, also implies a missing uh, energy conservation. Uh, if you don't conserve uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, well, sooner or later, this water vapor will condense, releasing latent heat. And again, so that missing uh, uh, mass conservation becomes a missing uh, energy conservation. And these are issues which may not be relevant at shorter uh, time scales. Um, of course, it's not all about uh, these radiative fluxes. And so, of course, uh, you're also interested in that the long-term averages or in the statistics of certain fields uh, are as realistic as possible. And of course, you have the problem of having good references to compare with. Uh, for ECRT, we the trick is actually to compare with error entering, which is sort of a cheating because we compare the model sort of with itself. But it's uh, um, it's helpful because at least it gives a clear reference what what to compare with. ECRT should at least be close to error entering if possible. Um, of course, it's not only about uh, fields; it's also about model variability, and so that's another thing you look at. And all this needs, uh, <coughs> and all these, uh, these these comparisons, of course, need some. Uh, uh, if you need to do this process of many variables, different groups, and you need to compare what you're talking about, you need to have some common measures, some common uh, way to talk with each other. So, uh, indices, uh, and by index I mean any number which can be sort of shared and which gives you a, a, a measure of skill, uh, it become extremely important in this sense. So there are, well, the simplest one is this Reichel and Kim indices, which were, were actually developed now for quite some time ago, which is basically adjusted uh, root mean square differences compared to some reference fields. Um, and then, of course, uh, a more refined thing is actually to look at the regional features, regional dynamics, et cetera. Uh, the, this whole exercise actually, as I mentioned, ne necessary also for coordinated experiments in which ECO is involved in, um, uh, to have a model which is well suited for this experiment. And the reason, it actually for each experiment, say you do CMIP6 or you do some other experiment like we're involved in a, a coordinated experiment called high-res MIP, which is actually part of CMIP, but uh, where you compare the high-resolution version of the model. Every time the protocol changes a bit, the forcing fields change a bit. And so, of course, you need to check again if your model is sort of well-tuned. Mm. Because some of the tuning you do may be specific for having made so much assumptions about the forcing fields. Um, say, ozone or aerosols, etc. So, um, I mentioned the, 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 the radiative imbalance. Well, there are many. There are very good estimates of this, of course, uh, recent ones also from satellite, etc. There is some liter recent literature about this. All these numbers have uh, uncertainties, which are still unfortunately quite large, um, 
basically it's always something like plus or minus 0 0.5 in all of these numbers. But still, we can use the central values as a, as a reference. And we would like to see the model to be quite, to be similar to uh, what is observed uh, at, in, in some of these numbers. And uh, the most important uh, numbers, of course, for uh, while usually you would uh, judge a coupled model in general, uh, a climate model, from the top of the atmosphere fluxes. Basically, you just look at the balance between what is going in in terms of energy, what is coming out. Uh, it's not zero because our planet is warming. Um, uh, what is actually more relevant for a couple of models, of course, the surface fluxes, because that is where the adjustment between the atmosphere and the ocean and the land surface is occurring. I would say mainly ocean because the land surface has a much reduced heat capacity. So what really counts is, a, is the ocean. And so, um, of course, it, it's these fluxes at the surface which will, will be particularly important. So as uh, I wasn't here the morning of the first day, so but I was told that actually Franco also mentioned this for, for IFS, that um, the first thing we discovered when we started looking at this to, to our dismay was that actually if we took the top of the atmosphere fluxes, the net flux at the top, and uh, compared it to the net flux at the bottom, well, this should be the same because the atmosphere has no significant heat capacity so there's no way, it, oh, average of a long time. So there's no way it could possibly store energy somewhere or release energy significantly. So um, uh, if, you, if you, on average, do the difference between what you get at the top and what you get at the bottom, you really should get zero. And any different number is an indication that the model is either producing or, or, or consuming energy. And we did that, and well, the number was quite significant, what well, was significant, very, very high. And we got this, this huge number of minus 2.5 baht per square meter. All, all these are at, at our reference resolution, standard resolution. At different resolutions, unfortunately, you get even different numbers. So there's also diff the sensitivity of this number to the model resolution. Um, this has, had been tested, etc. And basically, it's quite robust result. And um, <clears throat> And then, of course, depending on the forcing fields, you can shift where this, uh, this energy goes. Uh, so the, the, uh, like in IFS, uh, yeah, like in IFS, uh, the convention, of course, is that incoming downward radiation has positive signs. So minus means actually outgoing. And uh, in this case, this is top minus surface. So a minus really means outgoing from the atmospheric slab. And uh, well, so the atmosphere loses energy. That's OK if it were cooling. But if you look at, at if, uh, by looking at these experiments, the, the atmosphere was not cooling it significantly. So no, nothing which could justify this flux of energy. Um, of course, depending on the forcing, this could be distributed differently. So you just change, say, you do an, uh, an atmosphere only experiment. And of course, then, depending on your sea surface temperatures, this, the ocean may be too cold or too warm, and so of course these fluxes may either go inside the ocean or be released at the top of the atmosphere. But the sum is always the same. So nothing to be done about that. And you can fiddle as, and then uh, you could fiddle, you can actually fiddle as much as you want with your parameters of the model, and this, this difference usually is quite robust, as long as you stay at the same resolution, et cetera, as I will also mention. So in, basically, this is a, would, uh, nominally, this is an internal heat source in the model. And it's a large heat source because it is, has to be compared to um, mainly, basically, to what we're interested in in a climate simulation, which is anthropogenic forcing, which is something around 0 0.6 baht per square meter, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So 2.5 is embarrassing. And you could live with that, but the problem is you could just, if we were sure, it's always there and it's always the same. And if we understood what, it, what causes it, we can, of course, live with that. And we can also make future projections, etc. But we do not know, if we don't know the processes which are at the base of this, uh, in this case, energy production, how can I trust a future projection if I have no idea if maybe the process, these processes may change and may change this in a different setup. And in fact, there is a state dependency of this imbalance, which is unfortunate, as we show. So that's, that's important. So the first thing is, which, uh, which we quickly, well, well, took us some time, I must say, sorry, realized was that <clears throat> we were making a mistake in our balance. So 
because nominally the model saves all these fluxes. So you have your sensibly heat, your latent heat uh, from evaporation, um, you have your incoming shortwave radiation at the surface, and you have your uh, thermal heat, long wave heat uh, net at the surface. These all get stored nicely in, in grip files. You, you will see them in the output also of OpenIFS. Um, and it would be natural to sum them up and say, okay, that's a net surface balance. And that should be, well, 0, 0.6 if you are in a transient present day simulation. Problem is that the latent heat actually is computed only based on uh, evaporation and sublimation. It does not include one thing, one important player, which is not obvious it's, uh, immediately because it's actually a mass flux. It doesn't include snow. Snowfall actually carries with it a latent heat content. And it's quite easy to understand because the atmosphere actually to create the snow takes droplets, freezes them, and uh, to simplify, uh, freezes them and basically extracts heat to do, by doing this. So the atmosphere is gaining heat. The droplets, then the snow falls into, say, the ocean, and the ocean will use heat to melt them again and bring them to, the, to SST. So basically, the atmosphere has gained heat, the ocean has lost heat, this is a heat flux to the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a negative heat flux because the sign is upward. And, well, based on, 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 um, on, the, uh, on the average snowfall in the model, well, it's something around 0 0.23 meters a day, you multiply that by, 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 by 334 kilojoule per kilogram, and well, you get that that's actually equivalent to minus 088 watt per square meter. So that's huge. I mean, again, it's, it, in a sense, if the numbers are below 0 0.1, 0 0.2, I would start worrying less. But as long as we're talking about numbers around zero, comparable to the anthropogenic forcing, I would be quite worried. So, so this clearly has to be added. And, and the same actually also is true for land because also the land surface uses heat to melt the snow. And that this, of course, will cool the land surface, quite natural. And part of the snow instead uh, is sort of excess snow, which, will, which, which at least in this world becomes a flux called calving. So it's basically a representation of glacier calving. Uh, so it gets transferred to the ocean, and there it melts again. So it's a flux which in the end goes to the ocean. So basically, it's the same story also for the land surface. So this we had to remove. Okay, and so basically, based on this, we have to look at a revised version of our of our top of the atmosphere and minor surface. But well, it's still not a full 2.5. So we haven't solved the problem at all. We only have reduced it significantly. Then the other thing which we uh, found is that. Uh, comes from a complete, comes actually from, from solving a completely different problem. He said the, problem, the model is not mass conservative. It, uh, P minus E is actually 0 0.3 millimeters a day, was actually 0 0.03 millimeters per day. This may seem not very much. It's actually quite a lot if you integrate it over 100 years or so. So it will significantly change your sea level heights because this water ultimately will end up in the oceans. And so it, it also poses a problem in that sense. And in fact, it has to be corrected. And the initiate actually admit we correct this by then uh, uh, it's unacceptable that the water would, would increase. So in the end, any residual mass imbalance like this, we, we actually correct in the end by slightly adjusting uh, river runoff. But um, apart from that, um, this actually was, uh, could be identified to be caused, obviously, by, by, by the advection uh, scheme in IFS. So of course, it's an, it's, a, it's an error which comes due to the numerics of the advection scheme. It's a well-known problem. Actually, a lot of, uh, of fixes have been, have been developed uh, by, by using the ref, basically, in later versions of cycles of IFS. And, um, and actually, it's significant also from an energetic point of view because 0 0.03 watts per square meter, uh, sorry, 0 0.03 uh, millimeters per day, well, you do your mass and uh, you end up with a number like this. So almost one watt per square meter of energy because, it's, again, it's the same thing. You, you advect water vapor, but you create new water vapor. And this, when, once it condenses, releases heat in the atmosphere. So voila, you have a energy production in your atmosphere. Um, 
but okay, so, so we, we implemented the simplest possible fixer we could, which was simply a proportional fixer. That was easy actually to, to write ourselves. Then later we actually backported one from cycle 38. We could not backport more sophisticated ones because the code structure of, of uh, IFS has changed too much. So it would be significantly too much work to do that. It's actually a nice product. And uh, well, doing this, uh, P minus E actually was reduced, actually became negative, but at least half of what it was before in, uh, in amplitude. Um, and so this re residual minus 0 0.016 is due probably to something else, some other numerical things. But the main point is, so basically we reduce it by, instead of reducing it by 0 0 0.03, we reduce it by 0 0.045 or something like that. Uh, and in fact, we had a significant improvement in the top of the atmosphere minus surface imbalance, actually 1.4, which is correspondent with this change in the, in the mass balance. And so basically, at the end of the story, with all these things put together, now our residual uh, top of the atmosphere minus surface imbalance is only minus 0 0.27 watt per square meter, which is, well, we decided we can live with that. It's, uh, even if it's obviously still, uh, it has still a minus sign, and so it's still uh, an energy <coughs> production. Um, Okay, uh, something similar uh, while doing this, at a certain point, we also work with uh, stochastic physics. And so uh, investigating uh, stochastic physics, we also realized that also the stochastic physics scheme was not energy and mass conservative. And, uh, and um, uh, so basically this was leading to a very strong uh, negative uh, precipitation and evaporation imbalance, actually significantly strong because this now starts being a very huge number comparable to the average snowfall, basically, which uh, my view was 0 0.23. And uh, to, it was also corresponding to very large uh, top of the atmosphere um, minus surface net flux imbalance uh, in the model. Um, so again, in this case, we, we implemented a simple proportional, since we had that tool, proportional fixer, so basically making sure that before and after the application of the SPPT scheme, uh, these quantities would be conserved. Of course, it has a cost in terms of, of communication and, 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 and uh, in the model. Um, but, obvious, but it solves the problem because basically after that, if you use SPPT or you don't use it, the P minus E balance becomes exactly the same. So basically that problem is, uh, is, uh, is solved. And, uh, and then working actually with, with Antje and others at the ECMWF, uh, the same thing has also then been implemented even in IFS, IFS itself uh, as documented in, in this memo. Um, okay, so the, having sort of solved that, um, we, we, uh, we did a, lot, a series of experiments to actually uh, start uh, fixing in general the fluxes to to actually tune the model and get fluxes to our liking. And we need some tools to do that. And these are, sort, these are specific parameters which we identified for, for IFS, which we could actually modify. It's sort of classic or standard for all communities or all, all climate model developing communities to have to modify basically uh, uh, convection and, and uh, basically parameters related to the water cycle mainly or related to clouds and to the microphysics. And, uh, and so this is a list of the parameters which we experimented with. And um, <coughs> so all these parameters uh, will have, uh, um, yeah, and oh, sorry, and there's one here which is not really a parameter. It was a code modification which we also experimented. Problem was that when we first did this, we had very uh, irrealistic fluxes at the surface, even when we force the model with present-day sea surface temperatures. So basically, the model was, was uh, decided that it really did not like the, the temperature of the ocean which we were giving it, no matter what we did. And, and it was even by changing all these parameters within ranges which are sort of reasonable, all these parameters are not fixed. They are, they are not physical. They have no real physical value. They have recommended ranges also which you can derive basically by talking with people who implemented these parameterizations. And, and uh, there's actually, I believe, a thesis work uh, in Oxford, which has been done uh, for, 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 the, for, for development of the stochastic schemes, which also discussed this a bit. 
um, and then, so we, but basically we were not able to shift enough, basically, our fluxes, mainly our surface fluxes. So uh, one thing actually then by, by discussion, which came out by discussion, which is in the ref, was also that there is one change which was specific for cycle 36, but then had been changed again in cycle 38. Actually, it was a reversing because it was there before and then came back afterwards. And uh, which is this uh, uh, specific condensation limiter, a specific way how to implement this. And so we, we went back also in ECR to the old scheme. And this is actually, we could use it as a tool to shift uh, surface fluxes by at least 1.5 watt per square meter. So we had an additional tool we could use to to, to, to that. Um, here I talk only about global values, but of course, after doing all this, in the end, you have to go and look if your model climatology also regionally in terms of fields, etc., is still reasonable, and of course this has been done. So anyway, we have all these parameters, and at that point, what, what can we do? Well, you, you need to know the sensitivity of the model to these parameters. So we did a series, a lot, a series of experiments, relatively short, these are all six-year experiments, um, varying these parameters, so starting from the reference value and then increasing and decreasing them. So this graph is a bit older, but actually, each of these actually had five points in the end. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so you change each, so you see, these are all the parameters. You change each parameter and uh, see what happens if you increase them slightly or decrease them slightly within the range of what is reasonable. And then you can make similar plots for all possible radiative fluxes you're interested in. This is net TOA uh, surf, uh, flux, but you can do that for cloud forcing, long wave cloud forcing, you can do that for uh, short wave at surface, etc. So you have a bunch, you get a bunch of plots like this. And um, uh, for the, 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 the lines actually are, uh, I believe in this case, the lines, are, the lines here are where we would like these fluxes to be. So actually, well, that was a sort of a reference. But we re what we really were interested here were the slopes. And what is interesting is that most of these are reasonably <coughs> linear. So for our purposes, we decided that these are actually linear. So by fitting a line, we can actually derive these sensitivities. Don't look at the numbers. I'm just showing this to, 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 to tell you, that, to give you the idea. So for each parameter, you would get the sensitivity of a specific flux in terms of the parameter. So what happens by if you change the parameter in terms, uh, how much is the change if you change the parameter by one unit? And then you can put all this together. And so we made uh, basically a software tuning simulator to do that. Actually, we were lazy, so it's a big Excel spreadsheet, so don't worry, but it, it works nicely. And with that tool, actually, what you can do is to plan new experiments. So you can say, okay, I don't like these fluxes, how they look like. You can even implement a score. You could say, and this we did actually, you could say, I, I value a lot the net surface flux, so I give it weight four. I value a little bit more, little bit, say, cloud forcing, long wave cloud forcing, so I give it a certain weight. I make a score like that, and then I, I play changing these parameters and try to reduce, to find a minimum of my score. So to get a model configuration which is the closest possible to what I would like. And the nice thing is that this way you can plan your experiments, do that, and then make the experiment actually for, say, a reasonable time, say 20 years, get new averages, and then see how we have done. And actually, this converges quite efficiently. So in a couple of iterations, you get actually where you want to go. So that's a very useful uh, tool. So we were able to do that. We combined these. And actually, we, we decided we, we actually focused on a few fluxes which were particularly important for, for, for us. And, um, and we tested different combinations. Uh, this is actually an exercise we did a couple of years ago. So this is not what we would do now, uh, what we're doing now. but. It's illustrative of what we did. So these are all different combinations of parameters. And this is the end result in terms, say, of TOA fluxes, of uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, of the, of the different fluxes which we're interested in. Uh, this, for example, is this famous TOA minus surface difference, which, as you can see, is pretty stable no matter what we do. It never changes. There's nothing to be done about that by changing these parameters. But all the others are quite sensitive. And so you can actually find uh, combinations which really give you what you would like, and the green bands are actually the desiderata, where we would like the model to lie, right, based on observations. 
And it's interesting that uh, at least this was an exercise we did one and a half years ago, one year ago. Uh, that was based on the previous version of ECR with Amy Brandt. It was interesting that in the end, the winner was actually a combination of parameters which was pretty similar to what I, a later cycle of IFS, uh, cycle 40 uh, R1, was using, uh, with some modifications, but uh, uh, many of the parameters in the end we ended up changing in a similar way. That's well, maybe, maybe a chance, but was uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, uh, yeah, and so of course this has been repeated more recently with more recent versions of the model, now using actual CMIP64 things. And uh, so this is an exercise which is undergoing. And well, in the end, you can get really what you want. And still, then you can check the model climatologies, the uh, dynamics in the model, uh, the, 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 et cetera, and check that still is, everything is OK. And uh, make sure that, that the model is, well, that you didn't ruin anything, of course. Um, I do not have the slide here at the right place. But basically, in order to check or to keep quickly under um, control that uh, you do not do any damage by doing this. Um, you, you also use other indices. So we have this uh, Reichel and Kim performance index I mentioned before, which basically quickly gives you some numbers to tell you if you're getting too far from observed climatology. And uh, so basically, as it is, you shouldn't ruin your scores and still get a decent score, uh, even if you make these changes. OK. So um, this is, of course, not the end of the story, because this was AMIP. So if you now couple the model to the ocean, uh, different problems come out. Of course, uh, the first problem, of course, will be that uh, you may have the problem that actually you should tune the model for AMIP. And then maybe, since the ocean will have a different idea on what the SSTs will be, uh, could be tempted to also do a different tuning for the for the um, uh, coupled model. And that depends on your strategy. Of course, it would be desirable to have the same model for everything. But actually, when you couple the model to the ocean, new things come out. And this was actually a recent one which we discovered and discussed, um, which is actually the fact that uh, NEMO takes actually additional initiatives and adds further heat which you wouldn't have expected it should add or remove or remove uh, further heat, which you shouldn't expect to, uh, it should uh, do. Um, the idea is that the atmosphere is coupled to the ocean. It sends, uh, I can use actually this slide, which is exactly what I need. Uh, the idea is that the, uh, the atmosphere is coupled to the ocean. It sends, uh, from the point of view of heat, it sends a solar flux which is distinguished from non-solar fluxes, mainly because the solar flux is penetrative, so it goes deeper. And then it sends uh, the surface fluxes, which are the latent heat flux, uh, the um, sensibly heat, and the long wave fluxes, which all act on the first layer. Okay? So basically, IFS is sending to the ocean everything it needs. And then it also sends mass fluxes. And NEMO, of course, knows, well, it would be surprising if it didn't, that it has to spend heat to, to melt snow, so it will add that latent heat for you. So that's all nice. Problem is that then, NEMO, but most other ocean models, I'm told, also has to take care of other things. Like, you add a mass of water to a bucket of water, you're diluting that water. So it becomes important to know what is the temperature of the water I put in. It makes a difference to put, well, obviously. So there's a, it's probably not a good, term, it's, it's actually a wrong term, but there is a sensible heat content. In addition to the latent heat content, say, of snow, there's a sensible heat content in the temperature of rain, say, falling into water, or in the temperature of river runoff, or the fact that calving is at zero degrees. All these, uh, these actually play a role, and you can estimate them. There's also some literature recent which has uh, tried to estimate this. Uh, and you always end up uh, to a number which is similar to what we also get in Nemo, which is basically we, we evaluated this. And basically, this is worse. Well, it's not insignificant. It's worse minus 0 0.23 watts per square meter. So again, it's a number we could be worried about. Uh, I must say, though, this, this is an average over the ocean. So globally, it's a bit less, of course. And um, so this has to be taken into account. And why is it important? Because IFS does, does not take, care, uh, take into account of this heat. IFS did not spend energy to warm up the rain, whereas the ocean uses this, the warm rain and extracts heat. You see, there is a problem here, because obviously 
there's a non-conservation of energy in all this. And, uh, and uh, so the first attempt you could make is to say, okay, all mass fluxes entering the ocean are all at the same temperature, which is good and nice, but obviously it's not very good for, say, calving, which is uh, basically uh, uh, snow and ice which just melted, which obviously will be at a much lower temperature. So you make a mistake there. Um, uh, and um, so in the end, basically what we decided to do was to, to leave it as it is and to live with the fact that there's an energy sink in, in the coupling, basically. And there's nothing else you can do, actually. And the energy sink, of course, is less than this because, well, you have to, co to convert it to a global average, so that would be minus 0 0.16 watt per square meter. Um, there's another uh, thing which happens in the ocean, uh, which we have on, and which actually happens also, of course, in nature, is geothermal heating. Uh, personally, I thought it was not very relevant, but then when, if you look at the number it is, it's, well, it's this number. You may decide that's important or not, but it adds up to the, all the other guys. So in the end, you also have this 0 0.06 watt per square meter of uh, geothermal heating in the ocean. Just, that's physical. You, you, just, you can decide if to represent it or not, or if your does represent it. But of course, you have to take care of that and remember that when you do your balances and if, if you decide if the fluxes which you get to your ocean are realistic or not, because then you, you would have to add this, this number to your balance. And I just make a few final caveats, uh, points, uh, uh, which came, which, which one has to remember, which are that many of these things are actually state dependent. So say all other fluxes too, but say this, this top of the atmosphere minus surface imbalance actually has a dependence on the state. This was a series of AMIP experiments where we manipulated the temperature of the ocean and immediately this reacts and reacts quite a lot. So that is, uh, uh, that's worrisome because in a climate projection where the sea surface temperatures may change, this may mean that this difference may also change. So again, it's, it makes you worry. So it's the same thing. Until I, underst I don't understand what is the cause of an effect, I, I'm worried that it may be do uncontrolled things in my simulation. Um, the, 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 the relative fluxes themselves are state dependent. Uh, um, state dependent. So this, this shows you the same sensitivity plots I showed before, but done at present time and done in a future scenario, say in the year 2100. Main point, it's, it's the most extreme one. So the main point is that it's much warmer planet then. And, uh, you see, well, you could say that these are different and that these sensitivities are different. And again, we have a problem then. And uh, finally, um, this is a technical thing. I've, how many minutes? One minute? Two minutes? One minute, minute? OK. Final thing is that uh, there's a dependence on the time. So I just show you a final thing, which is this. That is, <clears throat> how do you, would you actually proceed to do the tuning of the coupled model, actually? And uh, what is very useful in this case is to use plots like this, where you plot some measure of your radiative uh, net top of the atmosphere or surface fluxes versus temperature, either global average temperature or the ocean temperature. And what is nice is that all models actually have a typical sensitivity. And if, while they wander in this space, they do that so following a, um, an approximately constant linear line, obviously, if it's short enough. Uh, ECR does the same. And the nice thing then is that you can, uh, you don't need to run your model for hundreds of years to guess where it will end up. Because then you can do an exercise like this. You can take, say, ECO, estimate this from a long run you have done, but maybe not the run with the final forcing, the final set setup, et cetera. You spent maybe months to do this, and now you want to get, get as much as information as you can from this. Well, the slopes are very important, because this way now I, set up the model with the right forcing, the right tuning, everything now is ready. And I just do a short run, a few years, 10 years or so, coupled, which may already be expensive. I look where I am, and then I can sort of guess where I end up. Because basically, what the system will do is we'll try to set to zero the flux at the interface between the atmosphere and the ocean. If you are in a permanent run, say you are in, you're doing a pre-industrial run. And uh, so this can be done, and this is actually an attempt to do this now with high resolution ECO, which is quite costly. And um, well, the details are not exact, et cetera, but it gives you the idea that you can sort of guess from already 
50 years of run what your equilibrium temperature will be, and then you can decide if you like that or you don't. Uh, the, two, the two sets of points are, that, are doing this either at top TOA or at surface. And yeah, I think that's, that's it. I, I mentioned also processes, so we also worked on, on improving some uh, uh, dynamical processes in the model, but I think we'll skip this. Yeah.